Ever felt like scaling and managing your application is a pain in the ass? Ever felt like you'd like to focus more on building valuable functionality rather than spending time making sure your services are up and running? Like you're paying more than you should be paying? Have you ever felt like you'd like to develop that one application that serves millions and millions of users but are just scared of having to manage and maintain all those servers behind it? Welcome to the Serverless Framework Bootcamp where you'll learn how to develop microservices using Serverless Framework Node.js and Amazon Web Services. Serverless Framework truly revolutionizes the way we develop serverless applications. My name is Ariel Weinberger and so far I have educated over 40,000 students holding a solid 5-star rating. This course is no bull I'm not just going to talk about theory here. Everything we do in this course is 100% practical. In this course, you are going to build a real-world application implementing REST APIs, authentication, message queues, persistence, and more. Not just that, but you're also going to become familiar with Amazon Web Services. We're going to be working with AWS Lambda, S3, API Gateway, and many, many more services. I will even provide you with a free of charge front end for our application, so then you can show off what you've built at the end. Demand for service experts is rising like crazy and for a good reason. You would be amazed by how quickly and easily you could take an idea to production with serverless. And you will not have to worry about your servers being up and running. By the way, you only pay for what you use. So if you're a developer with basic background or knowledge in backend development and you want to dive into microservices and serverless architecture, this course is for you. JavaScript or Node.js background is not mandatory, although it will help. So I invite you to join me and learn one of the hottest skills in 2020. You are welcome to check out some of the free lectures for this course. And if you are unhappy, you can always ask for your money back within 30 days. Hey, and welcome to the course. In this quick lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of the base project we're going to build here in this course. And I'm saying base project because there will also be a bunch of bonus sections. I know this diagram looks like a lot, but don't panic. You will see how easy it will be as you go on with the course. You're going to learn a lot, have a lot of fun, and build this whole thing in less than four hours. All right, let's go over this. The first part of the course and also of our architecture here will be the auction service. We will have six Lambda functions here in the auction service. Five of them will be used for performing CRUD operations. Think about traditional REST APIs. Creating an auction, getting auctions, getting a single auction, placing a bid on an auction, and uploading an auction picture. For these five Lambda functions, the request will come from AWS API Gateway, a service that basically provides you with a public gateway and a way to trigger Lambda functions using endpoints. Again, just like your traditional REST APIs. So those functions will have some logic in them, we'll do some validation, some data processing, and eventually we'll write the auctions to our DynamoDB table. We'll have an auctions table, and DynamoDB is a service that can be used as a database to store data on AWS. It is fully managed and it is serverless, and we're gonna learn about that one as well. For the upload picture Lambda, we will also upload the picture to AWS S3. And S3 allows you to store files or objects on the cloud. At some point during the course, we will introduce an auth service. The service will help us handle authentication and authorization. And we'll be using auth0 as well, which is quite cool. The service will have an authorizer lambda function. And all it does is going to authorize our users using a JSON web token. After that is implemented, we're going to introduce an authorizer in our API gateway, which means every request coming to those Lambda functions will need to be authorized using a JSON web token. This ensures that our API is protected, and we also know the identity of the callers, which is quite useful. One more Lambda function we have here in the auction service is the process auctions function. This function will be triggered by AWS event bridge periodically. And basically what it's going to do is going to close our auctions after one hour of being open. 
After closing the auction, we need to send an email to the highest bidder and the seller about the outcome, which brings me to the notification service. Notification service will have a message queue, SQS, which allows us to reliably decouple our services. An auction service in process auctions will send messages to that queue for emails that need to be sent. As you can see here, messages. Those messages will be picked up by the send mail Lambda function. And then an email will be sent using the AWS SES service or simple email service, which allows us to easily send emails using AWS. And that is it for the application. Again, this is just the base. And all the services we discussed here, SES, SQS, S3, DynamoDB, EventBridge, you're going to know everything you need to know about them in order to start developing your own serverless applications by the end of this course. So don't worry about that. That's it. I hope you're excited. You should be because you're going to have a lot of fun learning some skills that are currently at a very high demand. So let's continue with the course and start building all this. Serverless architecture in a nutshell. Serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model in which the cloud provider runs the server and dynamically manages the allocation of machine resources. Pricing is based on the actual amount of resources consumed by an application rather than on pre-purchased units of capacity. And this is from Wikipedia. Is it really serverless? This is a question I get a lot. The answer is no. The servers are there, but you focus on delivering functionality. All the traditional challenges of scaling your infrastructure and servers are just gone when you go serverless. With serverless architecture, your productivity is greatly increased because most of your focus is on coding and delivering valuable functionality. So in a nutshell, you pay as you go. You really only pay for what you use. If your users, for example, don't use your product throughout the night, you simply do not pay. It is supported by the large cloud providers and many more cloud providers, by the way. AWS, GCP, Azure, they all have serverless services they offer. True serverless services are fully managed. There is no need or very little need to worry about scaling. For example, Lambda, DynamoDB, Cognito, Amazon S3, CloudWatch, all these services can auto scale without any intervention coming from your side and you only pay for what you use. Decrease time to market, frees up developer resources to produce functionality rather than dealing with infrastructure. And this brings true business value. And lastly, language agnosticism. Today, AWS Lambda, for example, supports Node.js, Python, Ruby, Java, Golang, and C Sharp. So it doesn't matter where you're coming from and what your background is. If you want to do serverless, you can do it. So it's worth mentioning that you can combine serverless applications with non-serverless applications. If you currently have a few services running on some container or some virtual machine, and you have a SQL database somewhere, you can still make them work together. And the last thing is serverless might not be the solution to all your problems. We're gonna talk about that throughout the course as well. It is very useful for most things, many, many things you can do with serverless, such as REST APIs or processing chunks of data, processing thumbnails for photos, and really the list is endless. But there are, of course, things where serverless might not be the best thing to choose. And that's it for this quick intro to serverless architecture. In the next lecture, we're going to dive deeper into serverless framework and understand what this framework is about. Hey, and welcome to this introduction to serverless framework. Serverless Framework is a free and open source framework that makes it easy to develop, deploy, manage, and debug serverless applications. Serverless Framework supports multiple cloud providers such as Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, and a few more as you can see in this chart. The building blocks of serverless are functions. Serverless Framework utilizes function as a service technologies to execute your business logic. Some examples are AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions. These services are able to execute your code on the cloud you don't have to worry about the infrastructure and you usually pay for what you use. Simply deploying our functions to the cloud won't help us that much. In order to execute, they need to be triggered by some event. In this AWS specific example, you can see 
that our Lambda function could be triggered by Amazon S3, for example, when we upload a picture to an S3 bucket, or maybe API Gateway. We could expose a public endpoint, very useful for REST APIs, for example, that will trigger our Lambda function. Or DynamoDB, we could trigger our Lambda function when a record in our database is created. This is a sample hello JavaScript function that returns a status code and an event body. Now let's briefly talk about serverless YAML. This file is the heart of your serverless framework application and will be present in any serverless project. This is where you will define your service name, your provider, functions, resources, and so on. I don't want to dive too deep into the serverless YAML file just yet, but let me just show you a quick example for how you could define your hello function. You can see a provider object where we tell serverless, hey, we want to run this application on AWS using the Node.js version 12 runtime. We then define one function, hello, and set the event trigger to HTTP. And after deploying our application, we're going to have a Lambda function, an API gateway, and all this has been done by serverless framework for us. This will allow us to trigger our Lambda by sending a HTTP request. Serverless Framework has a very rich ecosystem of plugins, some official, some community maintained. These plugins allow you to easily add functionality to your deployment that would normally consume quite some time and also require you to write a lot of boilerplate code. So some plugins, for example, are Serverless Webpack, which allows you to bundle your JavaScript application using Webpack, Serverless Domain Manager, which makes it very easy to create domains and assign them to your deployments, serverless offline which allows you to run your lambda functions locally for testing with api gateway and serverless typescript which provides typescript support for your lambdas and of course there are way way more plugins than i can describe in this lecture and lastly i want to talk about the concept of infrastructure as code or in short iac this is a concept that serverless framework forces you to follow so iac means that you will define your application's infrastructure as code this approach has plenty of advantages, and it's not a new approach. Many technologies such as Helm for Kubernetes and Terraform already enforce this. Let's talk about some of the benefits of this approach. First, application infrastructure is side by side with the application that uses it. Imagine you have to revert your application to the state it's been in a month ago. You will also get the infrastructure that served it a month ago. If you don't need that database anymore, in your new deployment, it will simply be deleted and you won't be paying for it. There is less room for human error. Manual configuration of resources via the AWS console or any other cloud provider for that matter, leaves a lot of room for human error. We are humans and we make errors. We misconfigure. This can be dangerous to the smooth operation of your business. So infrastructure as code eliminates this. Increased side reliability. With AWS, for example, your serverless infrastructure is grouped into a cloud formation stack, which is really one umbrella for your application to be under. All resources, events, changes, etc. are there, they are recorded, and they are logged. With common IAC technologies, you don't have to take down your entire infrastructure when making a change. These technologies know what the current state of your deployment is, what needs to be added, what needs to be deleted, what has to be changed, and it will apply the required changes for you, and you don't have to worry about it. Lastly, IAC erases the extreme complexity of defining infrastructure. As you could see before, when we easily defined a function using YAML and got everything needed to run that function in a very developer-friendly manner. Before we finish, let's take a look at the output of a serverless framework deployment on AWS, for example. So this is AWS CloudFormation, one of the services provided by AWS that helps you manage your deployment. All serverless framework applications are deployed as cloud formation stacks on AWS. You can see the overview of all of my stacks, when they were created, and their status. After selecting one of the stacks in the events tab of my stack, I can see everything that has happened with regards to my resources in detail. I have full observability. And this is the resources tab here. I can see a list of all of the resources created by serverless framework and cloud formation. This is a total of 57 resources for this application. I cannot imagine having to configure those by myself, let alone maintaining them. I can even easily access those resources for debugging, go to the CloudWatch UI, DynamoDB UI, the Lambda function. This will help me debug and find issues very, very easily. 
And of course, there is a lot more to it, but that's it for this introduction video to serverless framework and how it works with AWS. Hopefully this made you excited to continue with the course and learn more about how to use this powerful set of technologies in your future project. Let's quickly talk about some real world serverless use cases and these companies actually use Amazon Web Services as well. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola costs went down from $13,000 per year to $4,500 per year after switching to serverless technologies for their vending machine flow. That is crazy. That is more than half the saving. Netflix. Netflix has been using serverless technologies to deliver 7 billion video hours to 50 million customers in 60 countries every quarter. Crazy. iRobot. By the end of 2017, there were over 2 million cloud-connected iRobots iRobot uses about 25 AWS services, such as AWS IoT, Amazon Kinesis, API Gateway, etc. So these services are actually consumed by their cleaning robots. I really want one, by the way. Vogue. Vogue has faced a 90% faster experience using AWS Lambda and AWS API Gateway. Their PhotoVogue platform serves a collection of over 640,000 photos, each of which can be up to 50 megabytes in size. CodePen. CodePen serves up to 200,000 requests per hour using serverless with a single DevOps team. And lastly, Square Enix. If you're a gamer, you probably know this company. Square Enix processes up to 6,000 in-game captured images per minute. So this is obviously just a very, very small amount of selected companies that use serverless. You can imagine there are many, many more that we don't even know about. Yeah, I hope this kind of gives you the feeling of what is achievable using serverless in terms of scale and maintainability and performance. And uh, yeah, let's go on to the next lecture.